666. Let's get to Yella, Mr. Wilson, and Yella. wrap this up. Saudi in a minute. Number one. Saudi defense, defense show bags $2.1 billion in deals, GAMI says. The General Authority for Military Industries, GAMI, which is, is also the regulator of the kingdom's defense sector, said that the deals cover a broad range of activities, including the direct purchase of military systems, the building of production lines, the knowledge transfer and training, and the localization of technologies and services. Quote, the deals come in line with GAMI's Industrial Participation Program, an initiative launched in 2019 as a successor of the Saudi Arabia's Economic Offset Program to capitalize on existing capabilities and to generate new in investments in the defense industries. Unquote. This is all coming pretty much from, or at least with the momentum behind it, from the World Defense Show in Riyadh, which is just um, finishing up and was a really large scale military expo that was happening at a, at a very curious time with the um, invasion of Ukraine, but just shows how seriously Saudi Arabia is taking localization of, of defense and security, technology, services, um, production. And it also shows how serious Saudi is about industry and manufacturing things locally and creating jobs locally. There's a lot tied up into this story. It's really interesting. It is, and I, uh, you, you see it unfolding, and, and as you say, it did come out of the World Defense Show. One of the important commitment to spend about a billion dollars, and a lot of that is to be local, local production. Um, so that's always encouraging. The uh, you look at the, the the industries that they've targeted, you know, automotive, a tremendous breakthrough with the, with Lucid deciding to come to the King Abdullah Economic City to to start a, a manufacturing plant, tremendous. Military, we see progress here. We have this major defense show as sort of a, a, a stimulator, a catalyst. Mining, which is already uh, uh, bumping along pretty well, just earlier, I mean, I think in January, um, had the Future Mining in, uh, Initiative, um, in which basically came out to promote uh, all new mining regulations and much more open in terms of inducing investment. So you can see them sort of knocking them off one by one, trying to get these industries going. And you set aside already tourism, which has really gotten out of the gate quite quickly and is doing very well. Uh, so you can see five years, what, five years down the line, 2016 uh, or so, you can see things falling into place and in real progress. Um, so this is, it was interesting to see this with the military sector. I'm glad you mentioned Lucid because this is a good time to remind everybody that <laughs> Yellow Number One was powered by the Lucid Air, and this is Richard. We're downpaying early our spots exactly. for Lucid for you know later receipt of the Lucid Air, which we're looking forward to very much. I can't um, wait. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> Yellow Number Two, as U.S. gas prices soar. The Saudi Energy Ministry awards two renewable energy products projects worth a total capacity of a hundred, a thousand milliwatts, megawatts. Excuse me. Well, if I can't say it, <laughs> <laughs> um, Saudi Arabia's Energy Ministry said in a statement on Monday that it awarded the Al Ras and Saad renewable energy projects with a total capacity of a thousand megawatts. The two projects are valued at around two point five billion rials, which is about six hundred and sixty six million U S dollars more movement in the Saudi green energy space. Yeah, well, you know, when we talked with Adam Semensky of, uh, with Capsarc, we, we, we wondered why it was sort of slugging along. And he said, well, just watch. It's going to start picking up. And this, I, a 1,000 megawatts, I never understood. Why don't you just say one gigawatt? Not you, but, you know, in general. Um, so this is another gigawatt in. And, and, and I think that puts them at over four now uh, in renewable energy. Their target, remarkably, and, you know, had been 20 by the end of 2023. I will say that the, the energy minister said that uh, there should be new renewable projects bringing their total capacity to uh, 15 gigawatts in 2022 and 2023. So they downgraded that a little bit from the 20 to 15. Nonetheless, it looks like they're making real progress and it looks like these next two years are gonna be really uh, productive in terms of bringing renewable energy online. And if you missed it or, or and, and you have like a drive or a commute or something, go back and listen to our conversation with Adam Siminski. He he was with Capsarc. He was the head of Capsarc, but he also was the head of the US EIA, just knows everything about energy yeah. and the energy space. And just a really interesting discussion. One thing he mentioned was 
we sort of expressed some skepticism that they could hit some of these benchmarks based on where they are. And his response was, well, that is true. It does seem like a long way off. But the more of these developments and projects that come in, come online, you know, the more momentum there is to build additional ones. And, you know, the curve won't just be a straight line. It, it could, you know, right. be a parabola. Up. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So it just it's just really interesting. And, you know, the more the merrier with with renewable energy these days. So that's great for Saudi with 3000 hours of sunlight a day, uh, sunlight a year. My favorite stat about Saudi renewable. Yeah. Well, they need to get to it if it's going to be fifty percent of their energy mix by twenty thirty, and and they are getting to it, and and so I and we've I'm really pleased to see progress, and I'd be um, if they can get to fifteen gigawatts by the end of twenty twenty three, well, that's something. Mm-hmm. So that's that's real progress because there's you know for two because two years ago they were at point five, right? And and the other thing that um and you have actually talked about this as well. Um, it's not just bringing new renewable projects online; it's also focusing on efficiency and changing your current energy mix to get you there, which is sort of what it's doing now with more gas and less crude oil for domestic energy use. So um, all part of the all part of a ship in the right direction, as they say. So very interesting. <laughs> uh, is this me? Saudi, number three, Saudi Arabia's first movie chain plans a landmark IPO um, movie. Uh, it's founded in 2019. Movie, M-U-V-I, is Saudi Arabia's first homegrown cinema brand. According to its website, the firm has operations in about 10 cities and with about 200 screens. And they're, they're, they've listed for an IPO. It might be on the Tadamo. Uh, it might be on the Nomu. But they hope to be valued at about $800 million. Really something, considering that cinemas were not even allowed as of a few years ago. I mean, we do use that as a consistent theme, but I mean, this is something that literally could not have happened um, just a few years ago. So, well, well, you know, by any measure, if you if you if you were created in 2019 and you're going to mar- uh, market now, hoping to be valued at 800 million dollars, that's three, less than three years later. That's quite quite the momentum. And they just I guess they just opened the largest cinema in uh, in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh it has 25 screens. Um, it's just a huge experience. So it's, I think it's um, it's a uh, Riyadh Boulevard city is where it is. It also sort of shows that the cachet of going to a movie theater in Saudi Arabia didn't just wear off as soon as you know movies were uh, cinemas were allowed. Pe- Saudis actually really like to go to the movies. Apparently, um, so it's not just <laughs> it's not just like a fad or you know some new thing, and then it it is just isn't interesting anymore. I mean, movie theaters are blowing up in Saudi Arabia, so yeah. that's really cool. Um, number four, Saudi Arabia's $500 billion Neom mega project is seeking to woo wall street executives from the crown prince's Neom mega project have invited bankers and investors to a meeting in New York next month as they try to drum up international interest in their $500 billion plan to build a high tech hub from scratch. You know, uh, so many things with Saudi Arabia in terms of its outreach to the U.S. in particular went, uh, you know, were put on ice after the killing of Jamal Khashoggi in, in 2018. Um, it's not, I think it's nice to see them putting their foot in, in the water and going back out and, and exploring. I think they have a good story to tell, and perhaps they feel like they're farther along and it's going to be more compelling. And, and Neom has hired more than 1,000 employees to move to the site, and and you know they 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 certainly have developed some specific ideas. So I guess they're now they've they've done this in London. You know the the, the the resistance is not so great there, but they've done this in London. So I'm I think it's great. I mean they've sent invitations to private equity firms, bankers, construction suppliers, um, and they I, there was uh, there's a rumor they won't just be in New York. They may go to other sites in the U.S., which again is a is is a, a big step. Uh, since ha- really having done nothing like this since 2018. And as everybody just heard from our, co- our conversation with Mark Thompson, um, Neom isn't just about making sure that they spend exactly $500 billion and that they have exactly the design of the octagon floating on the water off the shore. It's an, I- it's, well, it's not an idea, but it's aspirational. And if Neom comes up short, but you know they're still swinging for the fences, much like Vision Vision Twenty Thirty. Vision Twenty Thirty is not about the year; it's about the the vision, the like goal. The goalposts have been set, and I th- feel like that's what's going to be happening with Neom, is that it may not be uh, you know half a trillion dollar build, 
but I think it may hit some some metrics on renewable energy and uh, quality of living and all of that. So it, I'm Richard. You and I are both fascinated by Neom. We also see it as something that you know is very very Saudi in its modern day Saudi in its aspirational nature. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think the important thing. I think you make a good point. There's. Uh, People want to make a judgment, you know, you know, sort of a thumbs up, thumbs down on Saudi Arabia based on if they hit these metrics. And that, that's missing the point. Agreed. I think this is you, right? Number five. Uh, yes, number five. So I'm lying. I actually just lost count. I had to say it to make sure. <laughs> Saudi, <laughs> Saudi Crown Prince uh, launches custodian of the Two Holy Mosques Scholarship Program strategy. So the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Deputy Prime Minister and Chairman of the Human Capability Development Program Committee, launched on Monday the strategy of the custodian of the Two Holy Mosques Scholarship Program. The strategy marks the beginning of a new era in the scholarship program that will contribute to improving the citizens' competitiveness uh, through upskilling the human capital in new and promising sectors to fulfill the needs of the future labor market. This was reported by the Saudi Press Agency. Richard, we know uh, a good number of current and former Saudi students in the United States um, that were on the King Abdullah scholarship. It's sort of unclear as to what this means in terms of hard numbers. We were talking about this a little bit yesterday on the phone, but it looks like there's more of a focus here on getting the right students into the right position. Um, and I think you know a little bit more about this than I do. Well, uh, you know, first of all, it's a continuation of the King Abdullah Scholarship that was founded in '05, and it's been renamed. Mm -hmm. And we've we've talked about that. That was a a revolutionary uh, outreach where they send thousands, hundreds of thousands of young Saudis abroad to 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 uh, to be educated, to engage, to immerse themselves in, in not just in the U.S. but across the globe. So, and it was it's been refined. So '05 to 2010 and refined, and then another 2015. But as it's gone along, uh, it's and this is this is a, a another refinement saying you know it's now we're very very whereas before you might have a student come in and 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 take English as a second language for two semesters, and then move on to their major, and it, it might be a major in in in, uh, in something that's not mainstream, for example. Um, now, what they're trying to do is being much more specific, much more targeted in the sectors they want. So, for example, there's a, there's an elite universities track, there's a medical track, an international scholarship track, an excellence track. New specializations have been created that are consistent with the kingdom's Vision 2030 plans, including things like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, air transport, health specialties. So, so it's the same pr same scholarship program. But it's much more targeted, much more refined, and it's much more mature. It makes sense for it to evolve in this way. After you've educated hundreds of thousands of kids, now you need start to be, need to be moving just like they're doing at home in their in their in their uh, education system. Now you need to be moving to to generating and creating specific skills, and and young people with talents that will be able to plug into all these these uh, tremendous economic plans. And there's something in here that basically says if you can qualify and get into a top 30 university globally the scholarship will support that is that correct yeah i thought it might be top 200 but i don't have it up but i think you're yeah. you're, you're uh, yes that that exists it's just a, a specific number i can't speak to that's really cool that's that's awesome yeah um yeah the king of dollar scholarship was terrific to continue it in any form is a service to the Saudi people. And, you know, like we discussed, this is like one of the single largest efforts at cultural diffusion in human history. And it, it's not just, you know, Saudis imparting their culture here. It's bringing foreign culture back home, you know, to a lot of Saudis and Saudi families that, you know, haven't traveled abroad yet. It just was awesome. It was really cool. I'm glad to see them keep it going. Well, there's a time there, and they're still up there, where in terms of uh, foreign students studying in the U.S., it was China, India, Saudi Arabia. I mean, tell me what the difference is. <laughs> One, you know, you know, uh, you know, two two countries with over a billion citizens, and Saudi Arabia with 20 million citizens. 
um, not total population, but uh, yeah, the the effort and the commitment was um, was extraordinary, and I think it's paid off. I think it's mm-hmm. really paid off. Agreed. If you thought we would make it through one whole episode without mentioning golf, <laughs> I'm terribly sorry to disappoint you because we will be talking about the Aramco Saudi Ladies International for Yellow Number no. Six presented by the Public Investment Fund. It is returning for 2022 with the new March date set as well as the biggest early season purse in what will be a record breaking year for the Ladies European Tour. Players will be competing for a staggering $1 million prize purse. Those vying for the top prize include major winners Anna Nordquist and Georgia Hall, as well as Solheim Cup stars Carlotta Signata and Bronte Law. <laughs> there are, I believe, seven past LET winners who will be participating that I will not pronounce right now. No, because, wait a second. Uh, <laughs> that's all the point. Of this. <laughs> You're good. That's why I put this one together. <laughs> okay. Past LET winners Marianne Scarpnord, Olivia Cohen, pa- Pauline Roussin Bouchard, Steph Curiousu, and Anne Van Dam. <laughs> And the tournament's 2020 debut champion, Emily Christine Peterson of Denmark, I made it, will also you make did. appearances. You did. Well done. <laughs> I should have seen this coming. That's why you always have to read I think you, yeah, exactly. When I send these to you, you get, and that's, I, I, that's snuck in at the end. We really should do one in ladies' golf because we've done a lot. Little did he know. Uh, um, but this is, this is really cool. This will be played at the um, Royal greens in yeah, the same Kingdom place. economic city same place beautiful golf course where we hope to play soon um yes really really cool saudi golf and golf saudi have sort of slowed in momentum in recent weeks and it's something that we've covered a lot on the show um but you know the giving the ladies their due here this is a big tournament and this is a big deal for saudi and you know we don't need to get too much into the greg norman stuff it's just um you know th- the show must go on for saudi as it were well, and I think that I think you're exactly right. And <clears throat> whatever happens with the quote unquote Super League, it, you know, doesn't, you know, I think Saudi's probably still have a plan for that. But they just pulled off, you know, a major tournament in the Asian Asian tour and they're gonna do nine more uh for the men. But yeah, the Saudi ladies, this is actually the Ramco commitment and involvement with the uh ladies European tour preceded some of the other men's stuff. So it's nice to see it going along. And this is a regular thing. It's also nice to see them saying on the play, playing on the same course as the men. Absolutely. All these, all these golfers just have such pure golf swings. <laughs> She's so oh, jealous. It looks, um, so e- it looks so easy. It really does. Um, that'll do it for this week. Um, again, follow us on uh, wherever you get your podcast. But if you follow us on YouTube, you'll see that we have all these segments kind of broken out. It makes for a lot easier watching if you just want to watch some things and not others. Um, but we'll have our whole interview with Dr. Mark Thompson up there tomorrow as well as a few i guess i should should say today by the time you're watching this um, as well as a few other segments um richard thank you very much this was wonderful thank you lucian it was wonderful a great discussion with dr thompson uh and, and another good episode it's always fun mr lucian likewise 30 number 31 next week we're 30 and flirty now so <laughs> yeah, there you go um take care <laughs> all right you too thanks